everybody, welcome back. I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful lunch. Now, to kick off for the rest of the afternoon, we've got Holden here, who's got a wonderful presentation for us, and I hope you'll join me in making a feel welcome. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, ooh, clicky buttons work better when I click on that. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna be talking about dealing with contributor overload, um, which is, a nice problem to have, but still a very legitimate and real problem that many of us face in open source. Um, and so, despite my name being Holden and working on a project called Spark, I am not the Holden Spark. Um, I am, I'm very upset with the Holden Spark existing. Oh, can I talk a little? Sorry. Um, <clears throat> can, can people hear me at this volume level? No. No, okay. Um, is this, does the microphone just go for the recording or does it, is there anything here that should be? Okay, I can try yelling, but I, given that I have a microphone, I feel like I'm not supposed to be yelling. Uh, so uh, for this interlude, um, yes, I am not the Holden Spark car. Can people hear me now? Uh, it's like the Verizon ad, no. Is there, I don't, is the, it's on, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, do, do, do. I like computers. Um, okay, so I guess I can try yelling or you can try, oh, is it working now? Yay, success. Okay, that is great because I don't wanna yell for 30 or 40 minutes. Um, so yeah, I am not the Holden Spark uh, even though I work on the Spark project. Um, and inconveniently, after the Holden Spark car was launched, I can no longer find my own contributions to the Spark project. Um, so that is unfortunate. Um, so I am mostly upset with this car, but it's all right. Uh, more seriously, uh, my preferred pronouns are she or her. I'm a developer advocate at Google. Um, they're very nice, they pay my salary. I work mostly on the Apache Spark project, but I also work on a lot of other uh, big data projects, um, so like Apache Beam and things like this. I also work sometimes with more ancillary projects like Jupyter and Interact and, and things like this. Um, and yeah, uh, I worked for a bunch of people. They're all very nice. They all paid me money. That's, that's great. Um, I have a Twitter where you can follow me. The slides from today's talk, I will post them on SlideShare, uh, but since you're here anyways, it's probably not very useful for you. Um, and I have a GitHub with a bunch of code in it. If anyone's really interested in big data for some reason, uh, this talk is not about that, but I have a collection of videos about Apache Spark that you can go check out, um, and hopefully they're interesting to you. Um, and sort of in addition to who I am professionally, I'm, I'm trans, I'm queer, I'm Canadian, I, I live in America on a work visa um, that people are actively debating whether or not they wanna continue. Uh, which is a delightful experience, um, and I'm part of the leather community. And I think this is just, uh, for me, this is just to remind everyone that we all come from different backgrounds, um, and we should be nice to each other. Um, and, you know, if we all work together, uh, we can get through this a lot faster. I mean, you're in the community-related talks, so you probably believe this anyways, but I, I find it's helpful to remember. Um, so. You're hopefully nice people. No one's laughed at my shitty jokes about the car yet though, so I have some questions about this. Um, you probably care about open source. You, you're spending your own money and time to come here. And I'm actually really curious about the, the other point. How many people currently work on a project where they feel overwhelmed by the number of contributors? Okay, um, not too many. Uh, so does someone who does not work on a project where they feel overwhelmed by the number of contributors say, why you bothered to come to this talk? Um, okay, lovely. Okay, so you, you, you're just preparing for the future of uh, when your project becomes immensely popular and you have a very different set of problems. Um, and so that's great. And, and hopefully this talk will be useful for you and you can avoid a lot of the same mistakes uh, that I've made and other people I've talked with have made. Um, and so that's delightful. Um, Ooh, no, wrong way. Um, does one of the people who raised their hands for working on a project feel overwhelmed want to say which project they're working on? Okay, so we've, we've got someone from Postgres. Um, yeah, that, that's a lot of people. Okay, 
Cool. Um, that's awesome. Right. So I, I want us to start out with remembering it's okay to not fix everything. Um, many of us have backlogs which are much longer than we're ever going to get to. Uh, there are 400 open pull requests on Spark. I am not going to see all of those. Um, now, because we use GitHub, I can actually see that there's 400 open pull requests. And if I used a mailing list, I could pretend that there weren't. Um, but, you know, we, we all have very similar, or many of us have similar problems. Um, in addition to, like, simple code changes, a lot of us are probably more quickly overwhelmed with questions from users. Um, many of us wish we had more time to do this, and it's okay that we don't. It's normal. We're not going to be perfect. That is fine. You are not a bad person or a bad open source person just because you can't handle everything. Um, so we're going to talk about you know, what changes from 10 to 1,000. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about how it can be so exciting to have all of these people wanting to help us with our project, but we can still feel overwhelmed, um, and it's still work, even when people want to do our work for us. Um, We'll talk about some community structures, a benevolent dictator for life. Um, we'll talk about you know, consensus voting. And we'll also talk about uh, trying to use Perl scripts to solve social problems. Um, that works about as well as it sounds. But it turns out that we can use Perl scripts to accelerate social problems. Um, and they get faster. And sometimes that's good. Um, sometimes that's bad. And we should delete our Perl scripts. Um, also, just like straight to call out, if there's anyone who works on the Spark project, I'm sorry. I'll get to your PR eventually. Not a guarantee. Um, cool. Oh, right. Also, this is, this is a good point. If anyone has questions, you can raise your hand and interrupt me, or you can ask your questions online. I've never tried this accepting online questions before, um, but feel free to use it. So the other way of thinking about this is figuring out if a project is on fire, why it's on fire, um, accepting that the marshmallows are delicious, but we should probably do something about the fire. And then accepting, well, we're probably not going to put out all of the fire, but we can probably fix some of it. And we're going to focus on the parts we can fix. So small projects are great. I love them. I, I, I run a bunch of small projects where I actually know everyone contributing, or at least I should. Um, I'm not very great with names, so I, I don't. Um, we have really aligned incentives. We, we believe that we're solving the same problem, and we have the same goals. Um, and it's easier to keep track of the people using my software. Um, and for the most part, we don't have real formal governance structures, because everyone involved just sort of trusts each other. Um, and that, that level of trust and cohesion is really hard to recreate when you start adding people from all sorts of different companies you've never met in person and are strangers on the internet. Um, but large projects, like, they're not all bad. There's, there's nice parts, too. Other people are going to write our software for us. And that's fundamentally why I got into open source. I am lazy, and I want other people to write my software. Um, <clears throat> the other part is I get a lot more impact with my big projects. When I fix a bug in Spark, I fix a problem for like thousands of developers. When I fix a bug in like Spark testing base, I fix a bug for hundreds of developers. Um, and they're both good, uh, but you know, thousands of people can be nice. Um, it's also, you can have like pretty fun conferences when, you're, when your thing is really big. Um, vendors just throw money at you. And that causes a lot of other problems. Um, vendors are, are a very double-edged sword. But there's money, and you can get a job working on your software, so you no longer know what personal time and work time is which is just a really delightful experience. So maybe you're asking yourself, is my project on fire right now? Maybe, maybe there's just a lot of people coming in with contributions, and it's, it's just very bright and happy, and this is wonderful. There are no structural problems going on. I can just close my eyes, go back to sleep, and pretend everything's OK. So there's a bunch of things that we can measure to, to see if maybe our project is on fire. We can look at the number of user questions that we're not answering. Um, we can look at the number of things that are ending up in JIRA or GitHub issues or, or whatever it is that you're using. Um, we can, the one that we're going to focus on today is the code change request spiking and how to handle that. 
um, because that's where other people are willing to do my work for me, and I want to empower people to do my work. That is much better. Uh, the other ones are, are totally important too, but we're gonna spend less time on them. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of less measurable things which also sort of happen when it explodes. Um, and so, okay, maybe you look at this, you look at your open PR dashboard, or you look at the number of emails on the dev list that you haven't responded to, and you go, yeah, okay, there's 400 people who are waiting for my response. Last year, there were two. I think I have a problem here. Um, but why, why do we have this problem? Um, and so there's this sort of classic pipeline, and I'm not talking about the Meltdown Inspector pipeline. Uh, fetching problems, where we go from users to contributors to committers to project management. Um, replace these with the acronyms of whichever foundation you work within. If you don't work within a foundation, replace them with whatever acronyms you decided to come up with with your friends while you were having coffee. Um, and if we have a whole bunch of users show up all of a sudden, I can't just immediately turn them into committers. They probably don't understand my project. Um, and convincing users to be contributors, we, we also know that's, that's a frustrating problem. And most of us have leaky pipelines, right? Like, it's not one user becomes one committer. We get, like, maybe a few thousand users, and then, you know, we'll get a committer out of it in a while. Um, and so it's possible that if your pipeline is leaking too much, if too many people are just happy to use your software but don't really feel comfortable contributing, you're going to have some problems. But we're going to focus where the contributors don't become committers. So at the start of your project, back in its happy days before everything exploded, um, there was just this group of committers. And that's the people that are making changes to the code. And that's you. And you're happy. You're, make, you're writing software. It's OK. You have to write all of the software yourself, so it kind of sucks. But that's all right. Over time, your project might grow slowly. And if you have a natural sort of path where like, you know, you help your friends contribute to your project because they found some bugs they want to fix, you know, you can get this really nice little pyramid shape. Um, and this is a pretty sustainable, happy place to be. But we can also get this thing called like hypergrowth, where all of a sudden someone figures out that uh, they can use our thing to make money, or we solve an actual problem that people are facing broadly, and then we get this massive influx of uh, users. Um, and I say this means things can go south, and, but as a Canadian, um, this is not a joke about America. Uh, <clears throat> it's just slang. Um, as, or a joke about Australia. We, we love our Australian friends. Um, and so giant pile of users, contributors, and committers. And maybe, maybe if we're lucky, um, we turn some of those users into contributors, right? Let's say that it's pretty clear people want to fix their own problems. That's great. But then I have to figure out how to turn these committers, uh, contributors into committers. And if I don't, my committers are just going to burn out, right? They've got like 400 open pull requests, and then they just are like, oh god, every time I look at this project, I'm just filled with a sense of dread and load it, uh, loathing, right? Like if you remember back to the school projects that you always put off to the last minute, but just picture that being your life like constantly. That's not a good feeling. And a lot of us very reasonably react to bad feelings by walking away. Um, my therapist says this is not actually a reasonable reaction to bad feelings. But you know, this will happen, right? If, if your people are constantly overburdened, they'll just go and find a job or a project where they can work on it and feel happy about themselves and, and good about their life. And so then your contributors are going to get pissed off that there's no one reviewing their changes. And then your users become sad users because no one is fixing their problems. And everything is sad. But that's OK. Um, this is only one of the many ways we can fail. Um, we can even have this happen without hypergrowth, right? You can be working on a project which is just growing steadily in the number of users and contributors. But if you don't make an easy path line to go from contributor into committer, right? If that pipeline is leaky and you don't know how to bestow trust onto new people, um, you can still end up in this stage. You don't have to become an overnight sensation, right? You can, there are many ways to fail, um, is the short version, I suppose. So, okay, maybe we are on fire. The marshmallows are delicious. People are writing software for me, but I don't want them to all get angry with me and leave. Maybe we should do something about this problem. 
Um, so one of the things is we can get question overload, um, and this is going to focus on other things. But uh, for example, I have 22,331 unread messages for the Spark mailing list in my inbox, and I'm seeing some nodding faces. Uh, and I later unsubscribed from that mailing list because that was just not going to happen. Um, and this might not seem directly related to, to your committer problem, but when you, when you start out, your committers will probably get used to answering a lot of user questions. And you're going to have to teach them um, that they probably don't have the time to do this all the time. And uh, setting up filters is a really great way to keep your sanity here. Um, on the Spark project, the people who still are committers but also engaged on the mailing list have the filter set up for the very specific part that they really, really care about. And everything else, they just sort of hope it works out. And it turns out hoping it works out with a large enough project, eh, not so bad, not so bad. Um, you can use Stack Overflow. Uh, regardless of whether or not you want to use Stack Overflow, people are going to use it for you. Um, so you should probably think about what kind of answers are on Stack Overflow and if they're actually helpful. Um, and you should also ask yourself if your answers are easily searchable. I know a lot of us love mailing lists, but if our mailing lists aren't really indexed anywhere, then I'm just going to keep getting repeat questions. Um, and this, this can also happen if we're using things like Slack. I, I love Slack. But Slack and just results in me getting pinged all the time with more questions from people. And they're, they're often the same questions we answered last week. Um, so I love Slack, but I also hate it. Um, so we can improve discoverability. Um, if your th stuff isn't being indexed right now, focus on making it indexed. Um, take time and look for patterns. Right? You can res remove a lot of pain from the people who are involved with your project by finding common patterns. And maybe, maybe some of these things will be like, these error messages don't make sense. And you can go ahead and you can make them. Um, oh, question. Yay. Uh, <coughs> Are all junk. Yes, um, that's, that's a great question. So the question, um, for the sake of repeating it, is are there any solutions for projects which are rapidly evolving and last year's answers are now garbage? Um, and the short version of the answer is no. Google remembers things even when you don't want it to. Um, and people will still try and apply last year's answers to today's problems. That is always going to happen. Um, on the other hand, there, there are things you can do. Um, if you look at, there's a lot of projects where the documentation will have this big red bar across the top, which is just like, this is not the new version. Click here for the new version. And that's very useful. People still ignore the large red bar, but some people don't. Um, honestly, I think that problem tends to self-correct because people try the, pro uh, try the solution from last year. It doesn't work, and then they ask the question again. And so then we can answer it a second time, but you know, it's, it's all right. Um, you could go through and tag all of your answers on your mailing list as out of date, but that is way too much work. Like, I am not doing that. If there's someone out there who really loves Perl scripts, that can be a great task for someone who loves Perl scripts. Uh, but that, that task is not for me. I like Perl, but not, not SMTP. Um, I, I, I think uh, extracting the patterns into the places where error messages don't make sense. This is really common in Spark. We have a lot of things where you've done something wrong, and my solution is to give you a stack trace about Python. Um, even if maybe you didn't write Python code, or we give you a stack trace about Java while you were writing Python code. And these stack traces are very useful for our, our, our own debugging, but I want users to be able to be empowered to solve their own problems. Um, and so looking for places where you can just improve error messages <laughs> are great starter issues to factor out into people. Um, another option is to find people who like writing books. Um, I find it's a lot easier to find people who conceptually like writing books and have not written books before. Um, people who write books tend to not want to write a second one. Um, so find someone who's optimistic and naive, but good at writing, and convince them to write a book about your project. Um, please don't do this with your core committers, because it will suck their life out of them. Um, and you, you don't want to do that yet. Uh, that part comes later. Um, and, and relatedly, like, for example, 
I think one of the common arguments against books is that you know there's an accessibility barrier, you have to pay to get them. But it turns out torrents are a thing, and I don't really care when people steal my work, because um, when they steal my work, it means I don't have to answer their questions. OK, uh, right, issue overload, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, there's some really interesting, unfortunately, mostly closed source tools for detecting issue duplicates. Um, there are some open source ones that don't seem to work yet, but uh, I think they're, they're very interesting to try out. You can see this is an issue graph from Spark. Um, the large part is the unanswered part. The small part is the part that we fixed. Um, and that's just, that's just a thing. Um, some people try auto-close, um, and I think this is pretty good. Uh, one of the things which can happen when we just ignore issues is it's not as good as saying no. But saying no all of the time can get really tiring. So we can write a bot to say no for us. Um, and then the NPM people uh, did that um, with uh, some mixed reception in the community. But it, it took a lot of burden off of them. Um, OK, so what about if we've got pull requests on fire, right? Um, not just issues and stuff like that. How do we, how do we get more people? Uh, or how do we react to our contributor spike? Um, and there's three broad approaches that people try. Uh, one of them is they say, I've got too much code coming in. A lot of it isn't really what I was looking for. I'm just going to make it really hard to contribute to my project. I don't like that answer. Um, some people certainly do it. Uh, we'll talk about why I don't like this answer. Um, the other inverse one is we can actually say, oh my god, there's too many people. I know my solution is adding more people. Um, I'm going to make it easier for people to contribute. And I'm going to make my life temporarily harder. Um, and it's going to get better, though. And the, the last one is I have a social problem. I bet Perl can solve this. Um, right. So what does raising the bar look like? Uh, rejecting small or trivial ch uh, changes as trivial or irrelevant. Um, I think this is really bad because a lot of the small changes tend to be things which like, users have run into, where it's like, this error message made no sense. I fixed this error message. And by rejecting these changes as trivial, yes, we save ourselves having to review that patch, but we were already looking at it anyways. Um, we can also go ahead and pick non-standard systems just for the sake of it. Um, this is probably not a great approach, uh, but there's, there's a bunch of solid downsides. Um, and one of them is the only contributors that remain are going to be the ones who are OK with jumping through arbitrary hoops. Um, <clears throat> And if you reject all of the small changes, you're just going to get people bundling all sorts of tiny, small, unrelated changes into big changes. You're going to have lots of breaking API changes. Um, the other important one is once your project is successful, vendors show up. And then they pay people like me money. And I like money. And if you tell me to like go away, but my employer is paying me to put up with you, I will keep putting up with you, and I will be very annoying. There are lots of people like me who enjoy eating food and working on open source. Um, and so this making it harder is, doesn't really work. Um, but OK, let's focus on trying to fix social problems with Perl. That's fun. Um, bots, bots, bots. Uh, the simple ones are things that we're pretty familiar with. Deciding on a style guide, automating the linting, running it in CI. If I never have to have another argument with someone about spacing in my life, I will be incredibly happy. Um, I think making it faster to merge is important. Um, we can improve PR uh, discovery. So one of the big challenges in Spark with that 400 open pull requests is I should probably not change the scheduler, right? I do not know the intricacies of the scheduler anymore, but I do know a lot about how our machine learning library works and how our interface to Python works. So I really only care about a subset of the changes. Um, so I could make a bunch of different mailing lists. That's a pretty easy solution. Or I can use Python code, because Perl is out of style. It's very unfortunate. Um, and so in the, in the Spark project, um, no, I accidentally took a picture of my whole screen. Anyways, um, in the Spark project, what they've done is they've made this PR dashboard. Um, and it's broken down into the areas which people care about. Um, and this is really useful because it shows me things like, does this code actually merge? If it, if it doesn't merge, I don't have to care about it right now. Um, does it pass CI? 
Over here, there's actually a column which says, has a committer looked at this and when did they last look at it? So if someone else is already handling this, I don't have to worry about it. Um, and it also shows me just like everyone who's looking at it um, who, may, who might not be a committer. And so if there's someone in here whose opinion I trust, who isn't currently a committer, who's done a review, I can just go in, trust it pretty easily, and, and say yes or no quickly. Um, and then, you know, title and the various priority stuff. Um, users can set their own priorities, so they're, they're all bullshit. But that's fine. Um, all right, okay, and the other option to this is um, mention bot can also automatically mention you uh, on PRs. If you're using a different, you know, hosted solution from someone, find a compatible tool to route pull requests to the correct people, um, right? If you make it easier for me to do my job, I'm more likely to do it rather than run away screaming. Um, <clears throat> but if I could just solve this with Perl, right, we, we probably wouldn't bother having this talk. I would just post a Perl script and we would all be happy. Um, unfortunately, we can't automate all of our code review with Perl. Um, and more people just writing more code is how we got in this mess. Uh, we can actually like go factor out a separate project, make it, that project will become overwhelmed, and then we can have turtles all the way down. Um, so another really important thing that I think a lot of us maybe have difficulty with is deciding what we aren't doing and making it clear to the community what we're not gonna do. Um, and, and this is certainly a thing that I've seen a lot of projects struggle with. Um, and in Spark, we've, we've gotten a little better and then we got a lot worse. And now we're probably gonna try and get better again. Um, but creating roadmaps and making them easily discoverable for new committers. So it's like, these are the things I care about. These are the things that we do not care about is really important. Um, another one is you might find yourself with a lot of changes coming in to, um, for example, your scheduler or like uh, some, some other part. And it might be clear that people are trying to take it in many different directions all at the same time. And one of the solutions to this is to make it not your problem anymore. Um, and you can do this by making your code pluggable, right? Uh, we, we had some success with this with Spark ML, um, where we had way too many machine learning algorithms coming in. And I cannot read that many academic papers in a single week. Um, and so the solution is, you can write your own machine learning algorithms in Spark. We're gonna give you an API to expose them to our users. And so you can still do your thing. It's totally cool, but I don't have to review it. Um, we, we had the inverse problem happen with our Kubernetes support, uh, where we didn't have a pluggable scheduler, and then we ended up with three forks. Yay! Um, and different people ran those in production uh, and had different issues with them, and supporting them became a nightmare. And so now we're merging one of the forks back in about a year later. Um, and Interact also, they have a really nice roadmap. Uh, I'll show you some roadmaps which I think aren't super bad quickly. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is the Interact node roadmap. Um, these are the parts they've actually succeeded. Um, and it's like, these are the things that I really want to do for the next release. And if you want to work on this project and you can solve one of these problems, right, like people are going to do the work that you care about, hopefully, rather than the work that they care about. Um, in Spark, it was like, these, these are the major things that we care about for machine learning. Um, and notably missing is like, we're not trying to add new algorithms. This other thing is in maintenance mode now. We only accept bug fixes. I don't want new things coming in here, right? And, and people aren't always going to read that but enough people will that making your roadmap and making it discoverable is gonna make your life easier. And then when you say no, you can point it at this document, which you also wrote, and imply that it's the document's fault that you have to say no, right? It's shifting blame onto a different version of yourself, which can have a different name, because it's in JIRA. It's all right, they won't put two and two together. Um, I, a little joking, but. Um, and so here we also broke it down into like, the specific components. So it was like, if you're actually excited about helping us with these pieces, here's where you can go to find the details. Um, and this gets a lot longer and boring, so we're gonna not dive into it in too much detail. Another option is we can try and increase the amount of uh, PRs that an individual committer can handle. Uh, we can do this with better tools to merge changes. Um, if anyone's worked on an ASF project, uh, 
you may remember the delightful fun of trying to manage a Git repo and an SVN repo. Yay! I have two source control systems. They don't talk to each other. Um, and so uh, this is a place where Python scripts can actually save your life. Um, and, and ASF has gotten a lot better. Um, you can make it easier to review changes. Uh, so a lot of people don't like the GitHub review flow. I don't mind it that much. But if you like something else better, uh, consider using it. Um, and the other one is more tests, always more tests. Um, the biggest thing which I think a lot of committers, especially the new people who you're going to be bringing into your project, they're going to be afraid of screwing it up, right? And they don't want to get yelled at. And if your test coverage is so low that they can't really trust themselves, then they're just going to be too gun shy to be able to help you effectively. Um, the other option, which you can do in conjunction with the more tests, is socially change it so it's OK to temporarily have master broken. Um, this is a personal choice. Um, I think this is OK. A lot of people don't think this is OK. And the large projects where I work in, people don't think this is OK. I think it's OK if it's like, it's OK to merge it, and we can revert it. I think source control is amazing because I have git revert. Um, and yeah, better tools for reviewers. And don't just feed your committers Red Bull or coffee. Um, they will eventually get tired and demand snacks. Um, Right, and, but the other, the real core solution is we can just add more committers, right? I've got hundreds of contributors. Why don't I just make some of them committers? That seems like a really easy solution. The only problem is you're asking people to take something that they love doing, writing code, and do something kind of adjacent to it, reviewing code. Um, and I don't know, how many people wake up in the morning excited to do code reviews? Three people. Four. OK, how many people wake up in the morning excited to write code? Uh, a lot more people. And there's a bunch of people who don't appear to care about either that much. And that's all right, right? Like, at the end of the day, I like money. I'm here for the dollar bills. It's all right. Um, and I live in America, so we actually have dollar bills. Uh, but I'm a Canadian. OK, um, <clears throat> so uh, there's a bunch of things we can do. We can try and trick them. Right? Um, this, is, this is a solid approach. We say, hey, wouldn't you love to be a committer? You can get all sorts of cool tools. You can have this really cool hat. It's really awesome. Um, it's quite possible that uh, companies will be willing to pay them more money, especially if your project is at the point where it's really successful. If you're someone like Postgres or Spark, they actually want committers to, to work for them. So you can be like, hey, this might help you get your next job, or you can weasel more money from your employer. Um, an interesting question is how you pick your committers. Um, if you do consensus voting, it's a great way to eat at the Cheesecake Factory. Um, and a lot of projects believe in consensus voting. Um, I have opinions about it, obviously. I, wait, do you have Cheesecake Factory in Australia? OK, uh, what is your blandest restaurant? OK, it's a really great way to eat kind of bland food that is acceptable to everyone, but not exciting to anyone, right? That's what consensus voting gets us. And that might not be how you want to pick committers. It might be, right? Your project goal might be mediocrity. And that's OK, right? For a lot of projects, Bland but acceptable is all right. For other projects, that might not be exactly what you're looking for. Um, right. So you can also try and find people who are almost ready and mentor them. Um, this often involves tricking them into thinking that they want to review code for fun. Um, and so how do we trick people into thinking they want to review code for fun? So one of them is we can encourage the people who are working in similar spaces to review each other's code. And they might actually learn from each other, and they might think, wow, this is fun. I haven't had that work, but it might work for you. Um, you can try and teach people how to review open source PRs. Um, it's a really different skill than reviewing your internal code. Um, at least I found this when I'm working for megacorps who are willing to pay me money. Uh, there's a bunch of things that we have to teach them. Another one is, if you let people take project ownership, humans like owning things, right? If I'm like, hey, wouldn't you love to be in charge of the Python integration? They're like, ooh, yes, I like. 
in charge. That sounds much better than reviews code all day. Um, and so this is, this is a great way to both empower them and convince them that it's exciting. Um, it turns out, though, this is hard to scale. Um, mentoring folks to become committers takes a lot of time and effort. Um, <clears throat> so you can try and make guides to help people. Um, oh, right, OK, so the next type is, once I get a committer, I have to convince them that they can actually make changes to my code base. Um, and the biggest one is I, I find a lot of new committers are really afraid of making these changes. Um, make a guide for folks to follow. I think also a safe space for committers to ask questions, because we've just told this person, we trust you so much, we're going to give you control over this piece of code. And then they might feel really, really worried that by coming to us and asking us these questions, we're not going to trust them anymore, right? Um, and so finding someone else maybe who's not the person who gave them the commit bit who can help them out is a really good technique. Um, and mailing lists are scary, et cetera. Right. But uh, pretty much, um, you're on your own at this point. Uh, you're trying to con teach people the things that you care about. And the things that you care about are different for each project, which is why the AFSF's Mentoring a New Committer page says to do. Um, that is the extent of their cross-project mentoring guide. Very, very good. And, and I think, realistically, this, this just reflects the reality. There is no generic approach to mentoring. It is about what does our project care about, and how do I teach this to the new people? Um, right, so the counterintuitive solution to too many contributors is more contributors. Um, and part of this is you're going to get this whether you want it or not. Um, I think if you encourage people to make small changes and you're like, listen, I can't review your change to the scheduler. That is too complicated. If you can fix a bunch of error messages, that's great. and I can put you in charge of that. And you can empower people to fix small pieces of your project and take ownership in these places. And it gives the, these people an opportunity to get to know your project move forward, grow as committers, and then eventually they can rewrite the scheduler and break everything. Um, but that's all right, because then they'll be your friends and not strangers on the internet. Do, do, do. Right. Um, reduce the overhead to contribute well. If, you're gonna, if you have a lot of contributors, you want to make it easy for people to actually get what they're doing. Um, you want to set your expectations really clearly. Uh, I find a lot of projects don't do a great job of this. Like, they have their expectations written down in a wiki, and then they have their code over here. And someone goes to GitHub, and they're like, create pull request. But they never went to the wiki, because that's somewhere else. They're just not going to find it. Um, there's, yeah, lots of tools. Ideally, if you can, make your tools stop people before they get to you. OK, five minutes. I'm going to wrap it up so we can do questions. Um, Consensus voting, Cheesecake Factory, or whatever it is in Australia that's really bland. Um, benevolent Dictator for Life, it's a great way for me to eat Thai food. Maybe not so great for the people who don't want to eat Thai food. Um, at the end of the day, being a Benevolent Dictator for Life is really tiring. Um, democracy is scary. It's a feeling of a loss of control. We can even get this with consensus voting, because now I have to agree with strangers. We all have to agree, but I still have to give up my, like, this fake feeling of control. Because I don't really have control. If people disagree with me, they're just going to go ahead and make three forks of my project like they did last time. And then we have to like integrate them. And now there's hurt feelings. So regardless, life is terrible. Uh, right. Technical things will break, too. Uh, you can fix technical things often with Perl scripts. It's all right. Um, componentize, refactor, all of this stuff. Uh, I think this is maybe an important one to talk about. Um, testing infrastructure and, validate, and validation infrastructure is a thing which often runs on our own machines, right? our own clusters. Um, and this can be tough to trust people with because you're letting them screw around with your, your infrastructure. And just allow people to run a parallel version and play around with it so you can trust new people there. OK, TLDR, it's OK not to be perfect. I'm not perfect. I don't know anyone who responds to all of the pull requests on their project uh, once it's gotten past the point of the house on fire. Um, I have a book. You could buy it. It is unrelated to this talk. Um, but I receive royalties on it. So uh, that's a thing. If you care about big data, please buy this book. Um, mostly, OK, thanks, bye.
Right. Um, as we don't have a handheld microphone, I can run around and throw this at you or simply... I, I can repeat people's questions yeah. too. That, that might okay. get a little awkward. Do we have any questions? You can also come find me later. I am wearing a pink dress. You are wearing a beautiful dress Thank and you're you absolutely going to be visible wherever you go, especially in amongst all these people in these... I'm sure, not sure what to call this colour. I, I like, I like the, the hint of orange. It's, it's, mm. it's quite nice. All right. Okay. Th thank, you, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, okay. Holden, well, on I behalf really of the lovely people who are running this conference, here's a little token of shiny appreciation. Shiny things. It is very shiny and very <gasps> cute and fun. Oh, my God. It's shiny? <laughs> well, yeah, kind of. Okay. Cool. <laughs> thank, thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, everybody. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>